Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Norris. We're going to grow your leadership through neuroscience, psychology, and theology. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode number 24 of the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. My name's Patrick Norris, and our goal today is to help you lead with a whole heart, a healthy brain, and a soul on fire. I'm so glad that you're with us. In today's conversation, you'll hear from psychiatrist, neuroscientist, and author, Dr. Kurt Thompson. He's the founder of Center for Being Known, an organization that develops resources to educate and train leaders from the lens of interpersonal neurobiology and Christian spiritual formation. His two books, The Anatomy of the Soul and The Soul of Shame, are filled with amazing insights and tools to help us understand the brain and our spirituality. Today's episode is titled, Jesus, Science, Faith, Brain, Souls, and Minds. <laughs> Our conversation is deeply thoughtful and curious. We cover topics around the intersection of faith with science. We contemplate questions like, how do we know things at all? How do we know them? Where does science fit? How do we understand experiences? What is the soul? What is the mind? Is the mind limited to the brain? What is the mind of Christ? How does the mind of Christ relate to the body of Christ? This conversation is interesting to say the least. You'll enjoy inspiring, insightful, and energizing ideas in this entire show. But first, I'm so glad that you're with us wherever you get podcasts or in the video version on YouTube. We drop new content every week shooting for Thursdays of the month. If this podcast is adding value to your leadership in life, I'd like to ask you to subscribe to the podcast, like it, comment in the reviews. Also, help us get the word out by sharing on your social media platforms. If you subscribe and comment at iTunes, it'll make our show pop up in recommended shows, and that would really help us out. Also, I'd like to invite you to a Red Ink Revival Driven People, Driven Leaders free webinar. This hour-long training is with inspiring and fresh insights from neuroscience, psychology, and theology. It's to help you grow in wholeheartedness in every sphere of life. Our next free webinar is scheduled for Friday, June 12th at 10 a.m. Central Time. If you're busy during that time, if you register, you'll be able to access the video recording for up to a week. Attendance will open up a unique opportunity to meet in a small group of people with me and a psychologist to go deeper into what drives people. Go to redinkrevival.com today and find the Register Now tab to save your spot. For all my pastor friends, if you'd like to co-host a Driven People Driven Leader, webinar with me by inviting a group of your pastor colleagues and networks. We'd love to talk. All you have to do is get five to ten or more of your senior pastor friends rallied to jump on with you and we'll create a private showing just for your tribe. Go to readinkrevival.com slash pastors to check it all out. Then contact us with your interest. We'll get back with you quickly to assess your opportunity. Did I say it's free? You got to check it all out. While you're there, sign up for our e-newsletter that'll be in your inbox the first of each month with a powerful blog post as well as all our upcoming events. Go now to sign up. Let's go now to this week's episode number 24 with my friend, Dr. Kurt Thompson, as we talk about Jesus, science, faith, brains, souls, and minds. Welcome everybody to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. Today we have Dr. Kurt Thompson in the house and I could not be more excited. Dr. Thompson is a psychiatrist and neuroscientist. He's the founder of Center for Being Known, which trains leaders in the interpersonal neurobiology uh, of a person as well as the Christian spiritual formation. Uh, he's the author of two amazing books, Anatomy of the Soul and Soul of Shame. He's married to a social clinical, a clinical social worker, and together they have two kids. Dr. Thompson, it is awesome to have you on the show today, man. 
Man, thank you so much. It's uh, it's great to be here. It's it's an honor to do this kind of work with you. Thanks so much for having me. I love it. Well, let's jump a little bit into your backstory. Um, you have a love for neuroscience. You can't be a psychiatrist and not have some level of human behavior curiosity. Um, tell us a little bit about. <laughs> That's awesome. Tell us a little bit about uh, why you chose to get into psychiatry and and what uh, is the the backstory of your driver. Well, that's a great question. You know, I, I, I tell people that I don't know that I so much found psychiatry as much as it found me. Wow. And it's, it, it is just one more way I think in which God has been finding me over the course of my lifetime. And, uh, I went to medical school, uh, rather, um, conflicted about it. I wasn't sure that that's what I really wanted to do. Spent the first couple of years, um, not really all that settled about even being there, started our clinic rotations in our third year of medical school, not really clear there either about what I was going to be doing in, in those clinical rotations. And what, you know, I, I enjoyed surgery. I enjoyed OB. There are lots of things that I enjoyed, but nothing was really capturing my heart. Psychiatry, interestingly enough, had never even uh, darkened my imagination's door as something that I might be interested or want to do. And I'll never forget the very first patient that I had uh, was a patient who had some pretty serious uh, impairments. And I found my, uh, my uh, you know, as, as, as Wesley might say, I found my heart warmed and this, this sense that um, feeling captivated about this question of this intersection of science, which I was proficient at and really enjoyed, but didn't have the kind of passion for, but that as it turned out, I, I did have this, this aching curiosity since I'd been a kid about what it means for us to do what we do as human beings. Why, why do humans do what we do? I think that combined with my own temperament, my own, shall I say, uh, you know, I, I had my, I, I tell folks, my, my first existential crisis happened when I was about 13 and it lasted for about 20 years <laughs> on and off. And, uh, you know, this, this sense of uh, longing to be seen and to be known and to like figure things out yeah. um, really kind of, I think, uh, that that found me vocationally in that space in my third year in medical school. And about 15 now, 15 or 16 years ago, uh, after having uh, finished med school, having completed my psychiatric residency training about 15 or 16 years ago, I had another kind of reintroduction to my own profession when I happened to wander into a workshop that Dan Siegel, my friend and colleague, was conducting in New York City. This was back before Dan was Dan. And uh, I had no idea who he was. I had no idea about what the topic was, although it sounded really interesting. And I left that workshop um, intrigued and, and with the suspicion that my life was not really ever going to be the same, at least from a clinical intervention standpoint. And so, I, you know, I, I'll say that I have been... Uh, I, I, I don't I don't deserve my life. And, uh, you know, one significant way in which that's true is having um, been given uh, this opportunity, I think, to try to, as I say, preach the gospel in the language of neuroscience. Oh, come on, man. What does it mean, I think, for us to be curious about how we are called to be regenerated, renewed, to co-create with God a world of goodness and beauty that will culminate in the appearance, that will culminate in the descent of the new Jerusalem, that will culminate in the coming together of the new heaven and the new earth. And what does it mean for us to partner with God in between now and then to, uh, to do that? And for me, I think the world of interpersonal neurobiology, this field that I, that's the water that I swim in, uh, that has uh, revealed itself to be a language that I think is helping people make sense out of mm. faith at times when, um, you know, what they have been offered over the last 200 years uh, has, especially kind of in the cultural milieu that we're in yep. in the West, it's just felt kind of stale. Yeah. And I think that um, 
you know, the the world of neuroscience is yet God's. It's another language that God is using, as as we read about in Acts fourteen, this notion that God does not leave Himself without a witness. Yeah. And in this day and age, when uh, you know, I mean, God will use anything and everything in the creation to speak to His people, right. and I think this happens to be one of those things. And that's a long-winded answer to your question. Oh no, it's that's an awesome one. I mean, I just feel all these different uh, energy spikes as you're saying those things. Well, let's let's interweave then your backstory of faith. Um, let's go back into how did you come to faith in Christ and kind of build it so that we can understand. Uh, where you come from spiritually as you intersect with neuroscience? Well, I grew up in uh, a, an evangelical Quaker community. And um, sometimes people don't always know how to put those two words together, evangelical and Quaker, but that was the community in which I grew up. I had the great privilege of, in the time that I was, you know, in my developmental years, the pastor in our very, very small church in Ohio had spent the previous, he and his wife had been the previous 17 years missionaries in India. And I can guarantee you that the sermons that we heard in our church were not like any other sermons you were hearing anywhere else in my little town in Mount Pleasant, Ohio. And I think uh, rather osmotically, I think I was being spiritually formed even by sitting, listening to the stories that Milton Coleman would be telling us in his sermons, I think I was being spiritually formed, probably even in ways that I wasn't aware. Um, I, my mother was, my, my, both of my parents loved God, served God. My, my mom was, was undoubtedly the more active and uh, I think conscious and vocal spiritual voice in our family. My father was a guy of, you know, great kindness and generosity. Um, and those, I mean, I, I would say anything good about my life in many respects can be traced to those first 17 years growing up in Ohio. There are a lot of really, really rich, good things about that. But as I'd said earlier, my temperament was such that I also, uh, I had my first encounter with Jesus in a real way. My, my spiritual director of the last 27 years really believes that I had some encounter with the Holy Spirit when I was about 13 and wow. uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't know that I'm smart enough to be able to comment on that, but all that to say is that I had this overwhelming experience when I was 13, that summer read through the entire New Testament. I'd never touched the New Testament. My mother had bought me a living Bible. And usually I just spent time in the living Bible, reading all about David and Saul and the Philistines and so forth. And uh, after that summer though, I, I had this encounter, as I've mentioned before, uh, in you know in late middle school, early high school with questions about science and evolution and so forth and so on. All these things that, as it turned out, touched parts of me uh, in, in which there was great uncertainty about life in general. This way, I mean, the, the whole question about science and evolution, that was a bit of a red herring. That really wasn't the issue, yeah. right? The issue was, uh, again, as my friend Dan Siegel likes to say, the issue was, was I being seen, mm. soothed, safe, secure? And the answer is no. In I wasn't in particular aspects. There are many ways in which in my family growing up, I was seen, soothed, safe, secure. But there were some crucial ways that were particular to my temperament. Um, for instance, uh, my, my dad thanks be to God for his uh, deeply devoted life. But, you know, uh, we did not ever have a single conversation about anything substantive in the entire time that we were on the planet together. This doesn't make him a bad guy. He's right. a lovely guy, but he wasn't very curious about, as it turned out, the things that were most important to me about me. Yeah. My mom, thanks be to God for her life, was pretty anxious, and there were ways probably in which I ended up serving roles in her life that my father should have been serving. Yeah. So all those kinds of things mixed together, uh, it's like any of us, I think. Our, our, you know, God takes us where we are, and he doesn't like separate us from the world in which we're living. He meets us in the world that we actually occupy, not some pretend world where everything is spick and spanned and we don't have any problems. He meets us in the world that we occupy, in my view, to redeem everything. Right? He's not afraid of that. And so, um, 
my my journey then has been one in which I, I would say, uh, though that you know though, those essential questions of am I seen, soothed, safe, secure, have been ongoing um, kind of title questions. Come, you know, they come in and they come out. They come in and they come out. My marriage has been um, probably the single most important place where God has been forming me. I think you know anyone who's been married for a day, <laughs> you know, right. know how wonderful and at times how m- maddening it can be um, b- because of how much of ourselves end up being revealed to ourselves. Yeah. Right. And um, and so I, m- my wife is, uh, you know, they broke the mold. Uh, God broke. I, I mean, and it, they're just, uh, they're just. So I can't, I can't say enough about Phyllis uh, and the way she has loved me and been present for me and sees me and knows me. And what's interesting is that you know we are, we are not, um, we are not temperamentally cut from the entirely same bolt of cloth. And that's also been a way in which, right? Like, I'd love to be married. As I, as I tell people, you know, when I when I married Phyllis, I didn't really want. As it turns out. I didn't really want to marry Phyllis. I really wanted to marry Kurt, but who looked like Phyllis. That's what I really <laughs> wanted to marry. I, I really wanted to marry me. I wanted somebody who thought like me, felt like me, yeah. think, all, all that kind of thing, but who looked like my wife. Yes, yes. And, um, and so, you know, I, I think in that space as well, uh, there, there has been um, an amazing opportunity for God to both review and, and come to find me in those places where I have not always felt seen, so safe, secure. And um, I mean, that that journey now has taken me into a place where even finding those words, right, seen, so safe, secure, those words are ones that I didn't have years ago. Yeah. And the very work itself, you know, like I, I told I have some friends of mine who know this, that um, I write this book on shame. And then I had some events that happened immediately after that book that put me in a position where I had to deal with it in ways that I didn't even know that I had it. <laughs> That's and awesome. I, I figured, like, gosh, if I just hadn't written the book, then I wouldn't be going through this. I think there's a, some kind of a correlation with that. So anyway, hope, hopefully that's helpful. Oh, it's absolutely helpful. And so when you take neuroscience and faith together, um, yeah. you mentioned how you... Uh, love that science gives you another angle. I, I sometimes use the word color commentary. It allows there to be depth and perspective. Sometimes when, as Christians, we hear doctrine, we'll hear a text taught, we'll hear a particular concept presented, and we put it in this box, put uh, wrapping paper around it, and now then that is a paradigm that can't be tooled with. It can't be thought through in any other way than that one idea. And we Mm -hmm. end up limiting God, and we limit our freedom, and we limit our possibilities. And sometimes people feel like if you interpret that concept or that text differently, that maybe you're screwing with inerrancy. And it's like, no, 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 no. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's not that we are adjusting the sacred text. It's that maybe the sacred text is supposed to say more. Right. Maybe it's supposed to be more than what it was. And there is this tension within some people around science and faith Uh, that for me, and it sounds very much true of you, is that it actually gave you a different level of handling, a a handle to actually be able to make sense of yourself and life and uh, marriage and parenting and everything you do. I love that uh, about what you're, you're talking about. If you were talking with somebody, and of course we have a lot of pastors who listen to our podcast, uh, and they had the tension around science and uh, the, maybe the threat. Somebody on my social media feed just this week saw a post I made and said something about, well, I thought the Word of God was supposed to be the answer. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's like, well, yeah, absolutely is. The Word of God's the answer. Mm-hmm. And what we're talking about is that science is informing us as to what the Word of God meant, <laughs> that, mm-hmm. that it actually has a greater insight to us uh, to help us see that text. So when you hear somebody struggling through the whole science and faith deal, how, how do you talk them through that? 
Well, you know, I, I think one of the one of the important things for us to recognize. I, I, I go back um, to uh, the work of a sociologist by the name of Peter Berger, okay. and Berger writes about a concept called plausibility structures, which you may be very familiar with. But this notion that kind of like a fish that isn't really aware that it's swimming in water. It's just the literally water it breathes, so to speak. One of the things that's true for us as humans is that we are growing up and living in a cultural ethos, a cultural milieu. We're swimming in water that we often aren't even aware that we're swimming in. And so there are certain things that we assume to be true that may or may not be the way things really are. So, for instance, awesome. Awesome. Um, when it comes to knowing things, one of the questions that we have to ask is, well, how do we know that anything is true? How do we know that anything is true? Yeah. And one of the things that we often don't recognize is that the primary methodology by, by which we come to know what is true about anything, about theology, about the Bible, about yeah. science, and so forth and so on, at this point in 2021, and this has been true for probably the last about 100 to 150 years, we've been living in the context of the plausibility structure of science that tells us that the only way that we can know something, the primary, the most important way that we come to know something is through the scientific method. We mm. test things, we, we examine things, we research things, and without even knowing it, We've even, as Christians, taken that way of knowing and applied that to the Bible as if that's the way we now know what is true. How do you know that that's true? Well, what's interesting to me yeah. is that the very science on which is built this way of knowing now emerges with neuroscience, which reminds us that there are actually other and deeper and far more powerful ways of knowing that we don't pay attention to. Wow. And this and and we get this when we look at interpersonal neurobiology, but before we even got there, we get this in the 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians, where we read that Paul says there are those who believe that they know things who do not know as they ought to. Yeah. The one who loves God is known by God. Notice he does not, he repeats this again in Galatians chapter three or four. Notice he does not say the one who loves God, the one who loves God knows God. The one who loves God is known by God. Mm. The reality is that every human being comes into the world, and the only way that I, as a newborn, we like to say every baby comes into the world looking for someone looking for him. Mm, yeah. And the way that I come to know myself is if somebody else gives me the opportunity to be known. Yeah. So, for instance, when I'm sitting with a patient and they come in with depression or they come in with a sexual addiction or they come in with a, with a substance abuse or anxiety or eating disorder or whatever, I'm going to start to ask them questions in which they actually are not the examiners. They are the ones who are being examined. As it were, I'm asking them questions. But for them to come to know something, for them to come to know something about themselves, it's going to require that they vulnerably allow themselves to have the experience of being known by me. And by this, I don't mean they're just giving information to me about themselves. I mean, it's like when you walk into the room where your best friend is. Yeah. And you see your friend seeing you across the room, you you have this sense of like I'm in his mind, he's in my mind, like yeah. I am known by this guy. Yeah. And in that way, I come to know my story, but not because I have constructed a research project. Yeah. Not because I'm asking the questions, but because somebody else is asking the questions of me. Yes. And so what we come to find out is that. A far bigger question than how do I know what I know, a far bigger question than that is the question of in what story do you believe you're living? 
in what story do you believe you're living? Like I tell people like most of the time, I like to think that I'm living in the gospel story, in the gospel narrative, you know, until about 10 o'clock every morning, when by then I'm already either anxious or irritated or something. (laughs) And I'm demonstrating that I don't believe the gospel because if I did, I wouldn't be anxious. If I did, I wouldn't be angry at my wife. I did, right? I don't believe it in that moment. All that is to say is that there was a time when the world in the West in particular understood that science, the study of a creation that was organized, that was orderly, that could be studied, there was a time when people didn't believe that. There was a time when people understood the universe to be completely chaotic yeah. and it was not able to be studied. And that in, you know, over the course of time, in people's anxiety and their rejection of parts of the way the church had run the world politically, they threw the baby out with the bathwater. God went out, science science per se came in, and we kind of have been, it's been lost to memory to us that actually science is a subset of the story of the, that we are living in as the people of God. Yeah, It's not a separate thing from faith. Science is part of faith. Yeah. It, and, and we don't we don't even practice science without faith. And so these kinds of conversations that I have with folks about this, as it turns out, I said, ultimately don't get, you know, they ultimately don't boil down to, is it science or is it faith? It ultimately boils down to, in whom do we trust? Yeah. These yeah. questions are always relationally based, questions that ultimately get back to trust. And they are conversations, I think, frankly, also that just you know, they're better had over uh, long, lingering dinners with lots of good food and good beverages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think about like Romans chapter one when he talks about uh, that you can observe creation and you have to believe there's a God, you're without excuse. Well, to observe creation requires science. So we have this uh, idea that there is a, a revelation of God through scientific discovery. And Mm -hmm. that scientific discovery is are things that are observable, they're repeatable, they're measurable, they're things that you can see the cause and effect. When it comes to thoughts and it comes to emotions, we know on a neurobiological level that a thought is not mystical, yet nebulous, something that's just sitting out there in the invisible world that actually thoughts are neurons firing with neurons in the brain. Mm -hmm. That uh, emotions are when the neurons fire off and neurochemicals release. So Mm -hmm. every feeling, every experience that we have has a neurobiological impact um, Mm -hmm. or from a neurobiological impact. Within Christianity, you know, we always uh, tend to lean to this randomness, this kind of, uh, God, I'm living in a desert right now. I don't feel your presence. And it's as though God has isolated them when in fact their experience has nothing to do with God's sovereign action. It has completely to do with how the management of their neurons and neurochemicals are in terms of what is the gospel truth and what God is seeing and knowing and feeling them. And so, you know, I come from a charismatic uh, background, which has a, a high esteem of Holy Spirit quote unquote, gifts of the spirit, quote unquote, which I have a real honor for in my own heart and life. But in the, in the, the tradition that I came up in, it was uh, often you didn't have any kind of uh, measurable, observable, repeatable kind of scientific uh, study around that. And Mm -hmm. so you just waited for a, a Holy Spirit anointing or goosebump or whatever to power to manifest. And what I have learned is that you cannot have an experience with God as a human. You cannot have an experience without your neurons and neurochemicals also being engaged. Even Paul, when he's caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out, I do not know, comes back to the planet and he says, I heard things I can't even naturally articulate, but to experience the experience he had, had to work through his brain to be able to be uh, actually conceptualized and talked about. Um, And so when I think of all of that, 
And I think of, uh, you know, the mind, uh, the soul, uh, your neuroscience background, help us make sense. What is the mind as we talk about, you know, neuroscience? What is the soul? How do we make sense of some of that? Well, Patrick, you, you, you raised really great questions. I'm, um, and, and, you know, one of the things that we, that we do in our work is we, we, lean heavily on the foundational creation texts of Genesis. And we often return to Genesis 2, 7, where we read that God formed the man out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, and man became a living soul. This notion that who we are as human beings is that we are dirt and we are breath. Right, We are embodied creatures, and this gets to the question of what the mind is, that the mind is an embodied process, that the mind is a relational process, right? I, when I'm, I'm embodied, I, 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 and, I, and I'm, the mind is not just in my brain, it is not limited to my brain, because we, you know, how do you know that you're anxious? Well, you know because you feel it in your abdomen, you feel it in the sweat of your palms. If you were to cut your neural networks that extend out to the rest of your body from your brain, you'd have very little way of even knowing that you were anxious. Yeah. So we are embodied, and that corresponds to the dirt, right? We, that, that God sees that our bodies are holy. I mean, like, why else would he have done it like this, right? Yeah. There is a sense in which being embodied is important. But we are also, the mind is an embodied and relational process in that when newborns come into the world, about... 30% of their neurons that they need to survive are actively and effectively linked in a functional way. They're waiting for the other 70 to 80% of the neurons in their brain to take up their linking patterns, but they must take that on because of the interactions they have relationally with other human beings. Wow. It is the relational interaction that activates and facilitates the linking of the different parts of our mind together. All these things that we sense, image, feel, think, and do with our bodies. There are, and so we, we have that. So it's an embodied and relational process. My mind is not static. It's a moving thing. Yeah. You maybe except if you're a 14 year old teenage boy, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm not really quite sure what's going on in, in those <laughs> minds. Great. So, it, it, it's it's a process that emerges. This is the other thing. Like I, I'd like to think, I, I like to be a person who's in charge of things, who's in control, that I can predict. Yeah. And the reality is that there are lots of things that emerge for us in our minds that I can't predict. Yeah. I, especially like when it comes back again to marriage, for instance. Like I'd like to be able to predict <laughs> what she's thinking. Yeah. It seems I'm like just over. Right. Oh, for whatever in that predictive category. But this is this is what we would say. All of this is a reflection of how the mind is a system, a complex system in which we like to talk about differentiated parts. Right. I have my sensing brain, my imaging brain, my narrative brain, the part of me that tells the story, my remembering brain, my memory, my consciousness all these different functional parts of the story that need to be functionally strengthened and exercised as we grow up in families. I mean, how many of our listeners, for instance, grew up in a family where emotion really wasn't paid much attention to, or perhaps it was seen as a dangerous thing? Mm -hmm. My family, the code language for discipline for my father was, you stop your crying or I'm going to give you something to cry about. Now, beyond the fact that the logic didn't really make a lot of sense to me, it wasn't very helpful when it came to me trying to sort out emotional states. Yeah. So what happens when we grow up in families where emotion, which is the fuel in the tank of human activity, what happens when that doesn't get much mm. attention? If I don't have a way to learn how to exercise that, it's like a certain muscle group on my body not getting not getting much action, not getting much training, except I'm being asked to run the decathlon. Yeah. That's gonna be a problem. So it's differentiated, and those differentiated parts are linked together so that what I sense, image, feel, think, and behave all get particular attention, they all get their particular exercise, but then they're brought together like a great symphony. What? And this, to me, is spelled out so beautifully in 1 Corinthians 12, where St. Paul talks about the body of Christ. Yes. But there are these different parts 
these differentiated parts that we necessarily must have in the body, yeah. from visible to invisible, from strong to relatively weak, however we describe that. Interestingly enough, that the weak parts are the parts that God wants to pay more honor to. Uh, Isn't that interesting? Uh, that is interesting. And that this whole body is being brought together. And then as he talks about in Ephesians 2.10, God is creating, is constructing this body into his temple. We are the temple of God that requires, so we as human beings, as a community, yeah. we actually reflect what's actually happening in each of our individual minds. Is and this so is significant because for me, this is where also um, the power of Trinitarian theology is so crucially important because Trinitarian theology tells us, we go back to that first Genesis text that says, let us make mankind in God's, in, in our image, let us make mankind. This notion that we serve and are in a dance with a relational God. Wow. We serve a God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all of which are mutually self-giving to each other and saying to each of us, saying to all of us as his people, we want you to come be at the dance. Yeah, yeah. And part of that then is to be with one another, being redeemed, but not just being redeemed to go to heaven. No, we're being redeemed in order for you to then make good software, make furniture, make music, make babies, do all these, make marriages, do all these things because we were created to create. Yeah. And in so doing, practice for the heaven that's coming. Hi everybody, my name is Patrick Norris and I'd like to introduce you to our Red Ink Revival Leadership Platform, where we offer resources and experiential discovery to help you lead with a whole heart, a healthy brain, and a soul on fire. We believe driven people ought to know what they're driven by. Odds are you're already a high achiever and a visionary. But what are you driven by? What are your teammates driven by? What is your organization driven by? If you've ever struggled to figure you out, to know what winds you up or shuts you down, if you've ever been mystified by teammates who are stuck in old patterns of thinking, control, codependence, risk averse, grandiosity, and more, or if you have strived to change the culture of your organization, but somehow the opposing current has just been too strong, now more than ever, understanding the drivers behind your life really matters. Your leadership journey to wholeheartedness begins with our flagship free webinar, Driven People, Driven Leaders. This hour-long training is with inspiring and fresh insights from neuroscience, psychology, and theology to help you grow in wholeheartedness in every sphere of life. Go to ReadingRevival.com today and find out more. For all my pastor friends, how would you like to co-host a Driven People, Driven Leaders webinar with me? If you want to invest in other pastor friends, inviting a group of your colleagues and networks, we'd love to set that up with you. All you have to do is get five to 10 or more senior pastors rallied to jump on with you and we'll create a private showing just for your tribe. And it's free. Go to readingrevival.com slash pastors to check it all out. While you're there, sign up for our e-newsletter that'll hit your inbox the first of each month with a powerful blog post, and then subscribe to our weekly podcast at redinkrevival.com. Well, I think about the mind as you just described it, and that is such a, an amazing uh, way you built that together. Um, and I think about the rich man and Lazarus, uh, which is a story, of course, in the Bible where uh, this poor man named Lazarus dies. He goes to Abraham's bosom and there's a rich man who is across the gulf and he is in, in hell. And um, the rich man yells over to Abraham and says, send Lazarus back to earth so that he can tell my brothers not to come here. So what you have there is you have, uh, when somebody has died, they have memory they have relationship concepts. There's care uh, still as a part of that. Uh, so the mind has to be transcendent uh, and beyond the limitations of the brain as you described. Mm -hmm. But the way that you describe that with all these different parts, it makes me put a spotlight on, as an example, renewing your mind. 
Renewing your mind is not doctrinal learning. It's not academics. It's not concepts. It's the experience of all these dynamics together, which ultimately uh, has its, its height in relationship connection. We're wounded mm -hmm. in relationships, so our mind is hurt or injured in relationship interactions. It's also renewed in uh, relationship interactions. Then you got me to think, and, and I, any of this you can jump on, uh, but then I got to thinking as you were talking about the mind of Christ, that the mind of Christ isn't where I'm smart. The mind of Christ is where I'm integrated into the whole of this interpersonal uh, network between God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're one with with him is, is Jesus is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and we're one together. Uh, that puts a whole different kind of energy for me on the mind, renewing the mind and the mind of Christ. Do you have other discoveries or insights or thoughts on that? Well, you know, again, Patrick, uh, you're, you're um, touching on what I think uh, is, is crucially important. Um, I, uh, in, our, in our practice, we do a lot of focused work in the context of what we call confessional communities. Now, to the outside world, they would otherwise be known as group, they would be known as group therapy. But, <laughs> right. um, uh, but we call them confessional communities for an explicit reason. And, to, and, and in this sense, we, we mean by confessional, we're not talking about confessing sin, we're talking about telling our stories increasingly more truly. This is what we are there to do. Wow. And so you have, you know, eight people in a room, you know, women and men together and two therapists. And of course they come into this space for all kinds of reasons. It's depression, anxiety, marriage problems, um, you know, substance abuse, whatever, whatever you have, trauma, whatever you have. And our purpose is to invite people to consider that what they are doing there, they're not just there to talk about or solve the problem that they have outside the group in their marriage or their life or their work and so forth. That's not untrue. But what they are doing is that they are co-laboring. They are co-constructing with each other a new mind. And by that, I don't just mean eight individual minds. But you find that after only a few months of a group being together, the group as a whole begins to take on a story of its own. It has, a, it has its own remembered experience of, you know, when George and Sarah had a fight in the group with each other about something that George said to Sarah that really hurt her feelings and how are they going to repair this and so forth. Most of life, Patrick, whether we pay attention to it or not, most of life is made up of these kinds of interactions, whether it's at the grocery store or at your law practice or in the classroom or as a pastor with your elder board, these kinds of interactions are taking place all the time. And so we have this opportunity. I mean, as you rightly said, when Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yeah. You know, this isn't, he doesn't just come up with a concept. I mean, he's writing things that he, as you rightly said, has already experienced in his own embodied self. Mm. And so theology is a way that we make sense of what we've already sensed. Mm. First we sense, then we, this is what the mind does. First it senses, then we make sense of what we've sensed. And he's giving us this language of a renewed mind, that process, as my, my daughter, who our, our daughter, who is a pastor herself, and, a, and now a pastor going to be a pastor of her own church in Nashville, in in, in sep, starting in in August. Awesome. She was, you know, when she was at Duke Divinity School, she would talk. She and I would talk about, you know, about about Paul, and she would say, you know, he has this interesting way of mixing his pronouns when he's, you know, in one sentence between the plural and the singular. This notion. That even in that passage, Paul is mixing the the the, the pronoun use of, of individual listeners, individual hearers of that text, and the mind of the body as a whole. And so one of the things that we discover in these confessional communities is that at the same time that each individual is having a renewal experience of their own mind, right? Because they're talking about parts of their story 
that they've been working really hard to hide from everybody, including yeah. their spouses, including their best friends. They come out into this space, and of course, the parts that I hate the most about my story that I'm not gonna tell you are fraught with shame, are fraught with fear. Yeah. Fear that when you hear this part of my story, you're gonna run out of the room. Yeah. But when you don't, when you, not only do you not run out of the room, but you lean in closer to me, Yeah. That necessarily changes the very neural architecture of my experience of that memory in my story and functionally changes my experience of the story. Yeah. And this is what gives me an embodied sense of what it means to be in the room with the body of Jesus who's looking at me like Patrick is looking at me with compassion and care and kindness as I'm telling him something that I hate about myself, yep. and I can't believe that he's looking at me the way he's looking at me. Yeah, yeah. And this necessarily doesn't just give me a different experience. It changes the neural architecture in my brain yeah. and renews my sense of myself. But here's the other thing it does for you. If you're the one who's offering this to me, you find that you have the opportunity to be an agent in the healing of others. Yeah. Yeah. Because you sit with them in their pathos, and in so doing, it opens you up to be able to do the same. Yeah, yeah. And this never-ending cycle of renewal that takes place both in the hearts and minds of individual participants, but also as a function of the renewing, changing of the mind of the entire community, simply feeds on itself. Yeah. And we would say, this, again, is an expression of the Holy Trinity. This is what happens. Mm. Jesus, in, the, in, when he's in, in, in John's Gospel, glorify your Son as I have glorified you, and as I will glorify you again. This notion of the Holy Father loving Jesus, Jesus loving the Father, the Father loving Jesus through the power of the Spirit that's communicating all of this, this kind of renewal that, uh, in the process— eliminates shame, not just from my experience, but also literally makes it easier for us to put to sleep those neural networks that are actively representing shame in our life, in our memory, in our stories, and so forth. If I'm no longer going to be burning the energy that I typically have to burn to keep those shame networks at bay, if I'm not burning energy, keeping that stuff contained, that energy is now available for me to take proper vulnerable risks of creating in the world in ways that heretofore I didn't even know I wanted to, let alone was capable of creating. Wow. And so this kind of healing is not just about bringing us back to baseline. Yeah, yeah. This is about unleashing a tidal wave of goodness and beauty in the world. Now, the other thing I tell patients is, and you know, you don't often hear this from psychiatrists, like, I don't, I, I believe we, we do not live in a neutral universe. I believe, I believe in a thing called evil. I believe it is evil's intention to devour us. Yeah. I believe that in our work of renewal, of creating goodness and beauty, that there will be active resistance. Yeah. That goodness and beauty is anathema to evil, and it will, like, you know, it, it, you have a bullseye on your chest. Yeah. And so we can't be casual about this. We can't be cavalier about this. We can't assume that this is just going to happen. As I tell people, look, evil does its best work in the middle of good work being done. Mm. It waits for the creation, and then it comes and has a conversation with Eve. It waits for David to consolidate his kingdom in Judah and Israel, and then he sees Bathsheba taking a bath. Yeah. He waits for Jesus to be at the pinnacle of his of his ministry where Peter declares that he is the son of God. Yes. And immediately in Matthew's gospel as Jesus starts to talk about what will happen to him, Peter says, "No, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is not going to happen to you." And Jesus has to come back and confront that. Yeah, yeah. In the middle of really good work being done. And so this is the other thing I think, you know, we're in the middle of this process of creation, of new creation, of renewal of the mind. But we have to recognize that just as Paul wrote to Timothy, uh, anybody who's a believer, if you're serious about following Jesus, like you're going to suffer. Yeah. And you're going to suffer because persecution is coming at you. 
And I don't just mean because you're a Christian. I mean, it's going to be persecution of old stuff in your story that you thought that you'd had that licked. Ooh, yeah. And now it comes back around to get you again. Like, I'm 57, and I'm thinking, like, why am I learning things now that I – like, why didn't I learn these things when I was 17? Yeah. I wouldn't have to put all the crap in my own life that I had to put up with over the That's last right. 40 years. That's just going to continue until I'm dead. Yeah. The beautiful thing is, Patrick, that like I really believe in a God who has given us – the experience of each other, yeah. who's given us the texts, who's given us science, yeah. that continually puts before us his never-ending love and compassion that is intended to communicate to us that we are living in a story that is coming to a beautiful ending that will be, as C.S. Lewis said, just the beginning, yeah. and something that we have to continue to pay attention to. I, I love that. Um, there's, again, so many things that you're surfacing in me. I, I can say that one of the things about neuroscience that has been so gratifying to my, my sense of meaning is knowing like when I have these relational injuries or any kind of traumatic grief loss experience that my brain grabs onto that becomes these energy pockets that compel me to things that I may not want or like or yeah, I wish I wasn't that way, uh, that those happen uh, when the experience takes place that builds this kind of whole emotional framework for me, that that actually uh, gets filed in emotions of my amygdala. So mm -hmm. fo follow, and I know you know all this, but as our listeners hear it, that it gets filed in the amygdala. And the amygdala doesn't have the capacity to have a context for it. It just knows the emotion of it. And then the hippocampus gives the, the context of what happened. So the brain goes to the horizon and scans, maps out, don't let anything like that happen to you again. And if we ever see something similar to that, uh, then the amygdala will fire off the cortisol and the neurochemicals that actually put us in fight, flight, freeze mode which incidentally gives the power to the temptation that seems unmanageable for us. But there is another part of the brain that has the ability to calm the amygdala circuitry, and that's the anterior cingulate. When it's operating in empathy, compassion, gratitude, it will release the neurochemicals that, you know, oxytocin's one, that is the love bonding chemical, and it calms the amygdala, moves us into the pleasure centers of the brain. Now, all of that is just a bunch of geek speak, but I have to say, Dr. Thompson, that that helped me so much because it took everything out of randomness. And when we talk about uh, the mind of Christ or being of one mind and one spirit in a group of eight people in a process session where you are, I think you're calling it a confessional group fellowship, that when you have these relationships together and one of them is sharing their pain story and another one is leaning in and saying, I'm not going to fix you. I'm just going to love you in this space, that there is the firing off of the oxytocin among the people. People are feeling seen, heard, known, reprocesses all of that. And the brain then can look at the horizon new and fresh and not feel like it's under threat of being devoured by something that in the previous years of that individual's life, they were hypersensitive to. Um, right. That to me is so powerful. And so I just described it from uh, the perspective of a pastor who went through a certification program with trauma and addiction, but you're a neuroscientist, man. You're, the, you're a dog. Is there more that you can talk to us about some of that that helps us? Well, I think, again, we, one of the things that's important for us, for our listeners to hear, is that we are, we are a product of our history. And one of the things that our history has done over the last 150 years in particular is that as we have been educated about the world and what's true about the world, we've been educated to separate and to believe that there is a separate thing called a spiritual realm and a separate thing called the scientific or material realm. And the reality is that that just doesn't exist in the world, but we believe that it exists. So you're right. For a long time, many people have kind of felt like when we hear sermons or when we read the texts, that this is some functional 
abstract thing out there in the ether. Yeah. But yeah. What does that have to do with what's actually taking place literally in the neural circuitry of my brain and in the muscular skeletal system of my body? Yes. So one of the things that, um, I, one of the examples I give to patients is that if you go to the physical therapist and they are, you know, if you, if you have to work on your shoulder, they'll say, look, I want you to go home and do these exercises. If they just say, I want you to go home and do these exercises, and that's all they do, here's the exercise they show you, they t send you home, you're much less likely to do it than if that physical therapist takes a mannequin out or gets out a, uh, you know, a, a skeleton or gets out a picture of the human body and says, when you do this exercise, I want to explain to you yeah. how what you're doing is changing the nature of this tendon and this tendon and this muscle group and so forth and so on. What they are doing in, in, in articulating those things to the patient is they're giving the patient's left hemisphere an opportunity to make sense of what they are sensing when they do the exercise. And those patients are far more likely to go home and do their exercises. Wow. Because, and, and we might say, well, yes, because they understand what they're doing. That's, that, is, that is a true way to say it. But what we would also say from an interpersonal neurobiological perspective, we would say they're doing it because their brain is more integrated, because their left hemisphere and their right hemisphere are working in concert wow. because the thing I'm doing that I sense is simultaneously making sense to me. Science, science very simply, not that it is a simple thing, but very simply, science is a description of the mechanics of the mm. way the world works. I like that's that. all it is. It is not something that gives us a teleology. It does not give us purpose. It does not tell a story. Yeah. Human tell stories. Yeah. Science only talks about mechanics. But those mechanics can become crucially important parts of the story that we tell. Yeah. And so you're absolutely right. When we educate patients in these confessional communities about what's happening with their orbital frontal cortex and their anterior cingulate and how that is actually speaking to and helping to calm their amygdala and their brainstem. It gives them a way to actually reflect on what is happening and helps them take a breath, take a step back from being immersed in what's happening and then gives them the opportunity to make a different set of choices. Now, here's the other thing that's crucially important with all this. All the things that you described, and by the way, like, I, thanks be to God, like, I, 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 like, I'm coming out of my shoes here as I'm listening to you talk. A pastor who can articulate these neuroscientific principles, I just, I mean, like, oh my gosh, like, I, this is just, this is just, like, this is just wonderful. This, well, it's because this, of people like you. Uh, it's because of. Worry. Okay, <laughs> right. so, but here's the thing: we have to be careful to continue to remind ourselves that that whole notion of Kurt getting his you know, prefrontal cortex to talk to his brainstem really only happens with the help of somebody else. Wow, that's that is amazing. Yes, right. I need my in order for my prefrontal cortex to do for my amygdala and my brainstem what I need, what I eventually want to be able to practice doing on my own. I don't do that very well initially. Yeah, which is why I need your external brain. Ooh, come on come to my assistance and you become my, as we might say, external hard drive for a period of time, you become the one who helps calm my amygdala. Oh, that's amazing. Giving my prefrontal cortex opportunity to catch up and to then include you in the memory of my trauma, right? Because if I'm telling you the story about my trauma, and, I've all, and, and whenever I've told that story before, I've only felt bad or I've only felt the whole kind of fight or flight experience. Yep. If instead I'm telling that story to you and you are responding with mercy and compassion and presence. Yes. You literally now become wired in my memory as part of the story itself. And the more I tell you and the more you are present, the more that story is mitigated by your presence in my brain. Yeah, yeah. And as such, 
I can then, when I'm at home and I'm thinking about my story, I now think about Patrick being in the room with me. And I use you as a way for me to now practice calming my amygdala and my brainstem oh my with my prefrontal cortex. And so we see this whole notion back again to Ephesians 2.10, where Paul writes and says that God is building us up yes. into the temple in which he dwells. And we would say all these things, however you like to talk about grace, common grace, or however you want to talk yeah, about yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. We would say that this is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the work of God weaving goodness and beauty in and between us so that those things that I can keep track of more effectively because I'm learning about the mechanics of how the brain works, I do that in concert with my interaction with you as well. And as such, reinforce this notion that we that our mind is both embodied, there's the me part, and it is relational. There's Kurt and Patrick yeah. that are taking place all the time. And I think this is this is why it is that, you know, it's it's interesting, right? Where Jesus says, you know, where two or three of you are gathered in my name, there will I be also. Now, you know, he didn't have to say that. He could have just said, Hey, wherever you go, that's where I am. Yeah. But he went out of his way to talk about this two or three thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just trying to make more out of it than it is, but I just want to highlight that that's there awesome. is a thing in which when we are together in this community. Your prefrontal cortex is going to help my prefrontal cortex stay online when I just want out of the room, want to run out of the room with my hair on fire, right? <laughs> yes. And in this way, the renewal of the mind and its mechanics, I can be reminded by you of like, Kurt, hey, let's just take a breath. Let's let your prefrontal cortex catch up to your amygdala. Yeah. In a way that perhaps I might not be able to do on my own, but that with you, my brother, in the room, you enable me to love God even with all of my mind mm. in that moment. Oh, yeah. In a way that by myself, I couldn't have done. That is awesome. That is awesome. I do want to give a plug. Red Ink Revival, our platform, we start everything with a webinar. It's a free first step for anybody. But that is the access point that ultimately leads for somebody desiring to have this kind of group. We call them a process group. This kind of a process group with a professional to help guide and bring this level of connection together. Um, and so any of our listeners who are desiring, when you hear uh, Dr. Thompson talking about these groups and the confessional uh, dynamics that are there and, and how that it's actually transformed it's not just sitting and having pity parties or somebody living in uh, you know overt drama and everybody has to tolerate and listen to somebody tell crazy stories. No, these are some of the most intimate shared experiences that a person can have. And we provide those at Red Ink Revival. It all starts with somebody beginning with one of our free webinars and going through a journey of discovery with us. So I would just encourage folks to jump onto that. Uh, Dr. Thompson, your books, The Anatomy of the Soul and The Soul of Shame, are uh, books that everybody, in my heart, my path, everybody should read both of those books. I wanna say thank you first for gifting mm -hmm. us with those, for taking time. Nobody wants to write a book. Everybody wants to until you write it. And once you start writing, you're like, oh, what did I do? Why, why, this is torment. Um, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for persevering and actually publishing those. It's gifted me and so many, one of my dearest uh, friends, uh, a colleague from our church, uh, you, you, you made a radical difference in his life with the soul of shame. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm grateful. Can you mm -hmm. tell people how to get that, uh, both, either of those books, both of those books, and how to even get in touch with you? Right, so there are a, a number of ways to get them. Um, you can go to my website, kurtthompsonmd.com, where there are uh, the pages, the landing pages for the books themselves that you can order directly there. You'll also find blog posts and you'll find other uh, resources that I provide for folks that touch on a lot of the things that we've been talking about here today. Uh, included there, if you just want to check out the, a little bit of the Soul of Shame, there's a way for you to download a free chapter from that book 
uh, by signing up uh, for, for an email for, from us. So that's one option. You can also get them on Amazon, or you can get them directly from the publishers. InterVarsity Press published The Soul of Shame, and Tyndale published Anatomy of the Soul. And so those are two other direct routes that you can go to to um, act to acquire the books. And then you uh, did you mention you have a website? I do, KurtThompsonMD.com, and uh, we, uh, you know, it's 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 a it's it's about six months old. We 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 revamped it. The there's a, a group in Nashville that helped us develop that. We're really just. I, I can say that I'm really proud of the site because I really didn't have anything to do with <laughs> making it. Um, uh, but we tried to, you know, in, in this website, we we the the, the um, conundrum that I offered to them was I really want a website that people um, want to come to that will convince them to get off the website and will convince them to get out into real life. Wow. And how can we do that? So there are some interactive things uh, at that website, some resources and some um, things to read, pieces of music to listen to, pieces of art to view, wow. way of interacting meditatively uh, that are an attempt for us to help people tell their stories more truly to come to a more integrated way of living. And uh, so thanks for asking about that. It would be delighted for people to come and pay us a visit. I love it. Well, we have had such a, a, an amazing time today. You have thrilled my heart. I've got adrenaline running through my soul right now. I, uh, I so appreciate you. Look forward to uh, hopefully a future time that we can spend together. Uh, I know that we feel like, I feel like we just scratched the surface. I had a lot of questions about the anatomy of the soul that I'd sent you and we didn't deal, I don't think we asked one of those. So uh, that means that we've got to do a, another, uh, another episode. I, uh, I appreciate you. Can't wait to see you in person, get to hug your neck, and, right uh, and bless you, man. Thanks so much, Patrick. Great to be with you. Thank you for joining us. You might be wondering what's next. Consider jumping in on one of our free webinars called Driven People, Driven Leaders. These hour-long trainings are with inspiring and fresh insights through neuroscience, psychology, and theology to help you grow in wholeheartedness in every sphere of life. Attendance will open up a unique opportunity to meet in a small group of people with me and a psychologist or therapist to go deeper into what drives people. Go to ReadingRevival.com today and find out the details. For all my pastor friends, how would you like to co-host a Driven People, Driven Leaders webinar with me? If you want to invest in other pastor friends, inviting a group of your colleagues and networks, we'd love to set that up with you. All you have to do is get five to 10 or more senior pastors rallied to jump on with you and we'll create a private showing just for your tribe. It's free. Go to ReadingRevival.com slash pastors to check it all out. And while you're there, sign up for our e-newsletter that'll hit your inbox the first of each month with a powerful blog post and subscribe to our weekly podcast, RedInkRevival.com. Everything we're building is to resource you to be a wholehearted leader. I'd love for you to be a part of our tribe. I can't wait till our next episode, and I'm glad that you're with us today. We'll see you next time.